Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Smart Chart webinar series focused on EBSD. My name is Rena Samsu, marketing at EAG Laboratories, a Eurofence company. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items for today's event. All attendees have been muted. However, we'd still love to hear from you during today's presentation. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions panel located in the bottom right of your screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. Linda Romano, Scientific Fellow at EAG Laboratories, will be answering some of the questions during the presentation, and we will also collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. At the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is greatly appreciated and will help us to improve our future events. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Jingyi Zhang, EBSD scientist at EAG Laboratories. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Reina, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone who joined us today at this time. This is one of the series of our Smart Chart webinar series. This is focusing on electron backscatter diffraction or EBSD technique. Um, a little bit on myself, I am the EBSD lead scientist in EAG Labs. I have over seven years of experience in material science and specializes in EBSD analysis. Today's webinar structure. So first of all, we're gonna have a introduction to EAG Labs, our structure and services that we offer. The title of the series of the webinar is the smart chart. We will go through that real quickly. Hopefully that will be a Great help to you guys. Um, then we'll dive down into the EBSD stuff, fundamentals of EBSD, what it is, and I'm gonna present a few case studies, some examples on the standard materials, including metal materials, ceramics, and multi-phase structures. And then I'll also touch on a rising to be popular tech derivative technique that is called ECCI for high quality single crystal defect density check. In the end, I'll go through the strengths and limitation of our technique and some of the complementary technique that will help and expand the study uh, of your uh, project. So EAG lab was uh, established in 1978, based in Silicon Valley, California. We have over 20 locations in seven countries. We have over 40 analytical techniques, over 300 instruments, and about 800 scientists and engineers, many with PhD degree. We offer our EBSC services at our Sunnyvale lab, LA lab in California, and also in Eindhoven, Netherlands lab. The foundation of EAG lab is a semiconductor industry. However, with the, over the years development, we have a wide range of equipment and diversity of expertise, allowing us to provide our clients with comprehensive and peer review reports with a few days of sample, uh, with few days after sample receipt. When necessary, we can also offer like same day services for certain techniques. So here is the title, the smart chart webinar theory. Uh, here is smart chart, what we call this, is a, a criminal for a spectroscopy and microscopy analytical resolution tool. This one is plotted to show uh, each technique with their attributes related to spot size and detection limit. They, they are color coded according to the description of the lower left. The dark blue ones provide elemental in information, the green shows imaging information. EVSD is right here. Uh, at the bottom, you might think it's an imaging uh, technique that was showing green. Here I actually mark in orange to see to show that it actually also provides some structural information uh, for face identification and crystal structure information. So I'm putting it here to a few tenths of nanometer detection range all the way to one centimeter. So the smallest grain size weave analysis was close to 20 nanometers for some nanotwin structures. And the lar largest scan size I've uh, provided to clients here was a couple centimeters in width. Um, with those kind of data, EBSD performs space identification, green orientation mapping, 
you can also identify and analyze green uh, boundaries. Uh, here we're saying low green boundaries and twins. Actually, we have the full information. We can do any analysis uh, of whichever green boundary type they are interested in. So here we're moving on to the backscatter diffraction background. This is a standard a typical image of our tool running ABSC test. Here uh, you can see the stub. On top of it, we have a very small piece of chip that is our sample. Um, and this top has the SEM pole piece electron coming down from this direction. And on the right hand, we have the ABSC detector that is inserted when the sample is ready and in position. As we can see, the sample is actually tilted 70 degrees uh, relative to the normal horizontal sample layout direction. What's going to happen is once we start the detection, the electron beam comes down from the pole piece vertically to the sample, and the electron will have interaction with the lattice of the crystal lattice, and they will be diffracted and collected on this screen over here on top of the EBSD detector, the raw data we're collecting somehow looks like this. This is called a Kikuchi pattern map. Here we are seeing bright or high density of electrons along some uh, dense structures. These are actual atomic plane projections to this, uh, to this detector surface. Uh, we will also see different Atomic planes have inter, uh, intersectors, and these are, are um, dome axes. Because these are direct projection of the structure of our lattice, um, the strength of EBSD is actually in simulation in the processing. These events will be automatic, uh, will be processed and picked out. Then we can get angles between different bands because of the unique crystal structure of each of the sample and the phase we analysis, we're analyzing the angle between different bands will be somehow unique. And then once we have the simulated band pattern structure, we can go back and fit this little patch of information onto the sphere of the full 3D structure of the crystal possible Kikuchi map structure, then we can understand which orientation the incident beam is coming in relative to the crystal structure. And then we'll back out the orientation, the rotation in 3D space of the crystal at the point we're scanning at. So this could be a little complicated, the back and forth of the co uh, coordinates reference, but just to, uh, just to wrap it up, basically we have an incident beam direction fixed at this uh, at fixed direction. And then the lattice crystal structure orientation and the Kikuchi, pan, uh, Kikuchi pattern structure will have a one-to-one -one correction, a correlation. So then we can calculate back and figure out at each focus point what is the crystal orientation at that point. During actual test, we'll have a major step of the pattern collection, the orientation simulation using Predicting knowledge of the crystal structure. And then, because we're in the scanning electron microscopy, we repeat this process point by point to cover the area of interest. And once we have enough of the points collected and their orientation calculated, we'll make each point a pixel of this beautiful picture we're coming out as our actual raw result. This is an uh, orientation map. Typically, EBSC result will first start with this map. So it looks pretty and interesting. We're already seeing some of the green structures. We're seeing twins, uh, twin structures. But what we can do with this image? What analysis and information does it provide us? So here are some typical analysis we provide to our clients, and that's kind of popular options. When we, st we start with the orientation map, different colors uh, tells you what is different orientation at each spot, and that gives us reference to define the grains, the twins, and the grain boundary structures. With that definition, we can assign each individual twin or grain 
a unique color, then we know our definition of the green, where it starts and where it ends, how many pixels, and the shape, aspect ratio can all be calculated. A standard result we provide is green side distribution. We can do every year or uh, diameter. ASTM standard can also be provided too. Um, we can also do a face map. For this particular example, it's not very interesting. This is all just BCC structure is showing pure right here. However, whenever we have dual phase structure or multi phase, we will be able to see the different phase uh, color showing up and their distribution and relationship with each other in the, in the sample space. With that information, we can also grab uh, some information about the texture of the material. Here is a result generated also from this orientation map. We have a standard pole figure plotted here. We'll see, we can see if there is any preferred orientation and any deformation texture forming up in the sample and parallel compare different samples with that information. And here I'm also showing the grain boundary analysis. As you can see, some of the grain boundaries are colored with different colors. In this particular case, I think we were just simply doing misorientation angle to assign different colors. However, we can also do high and low grain boundaries and twin grain boundaries of any specific kind of sigma three, sigma seven, or whichever you're interested in. So these are general capabilities we we'll standard uh, we provide with our standard report. Before we move on to more uh, case studies, a quick rundown of the sample requirements for the test. Uh, of course, the sample will first have to be a crystalline sample, or at least partially crystalline. Uh, we will only get our uh, pad Kikuchi pattern or useful signal from uniform lattice. If it's amorphous, then we can't do much about it. We can't tell you how much area is amorphous that is. Uh, the area we cannot index, but that's uh, about it. And the sample have to be really flat, smooth, and very clean surface. To do that, we do provide a variety of sample prep in-house. Uh, typically for block material, it will be kind of mounted and uh, mechanical polish, like showing here. Uh, smaller structures, we can also do IONO uh, preparation, sometimes electrical polish or even set lift uh, or TM sample prop. Uh, especially class of samples are as deposited films and wafers. When they have a narrow like finish, a lot of times we can go ahead and try with those surfaces. And a lot of those samples give really good result without any sample prep too. The sample have to be uncoated. We, we prefer to accept samples with no uh, heavy element coating because this technique is a very surface sensitive technique. It only collects information from the top 10 to 40 nanometers ish layer of the surface. And then a resolution can vary depend on the material system and the deformation level, but the best we can do is about 40 nanometers for grain size, uh, 50 nanometers for grain size. And for transmission mode, it pushes down to 20 nanometers. Uh, we accept sample size typically smaller than one inch, um, or prefer on um, smaller than one centimeter on all dimensions. All right. So with those in mind, we're moving on to a first case study. The first one after that steel sample I already showed. So this one is a multi-layer ceramic chip capacitor that capacitor that I bought on eBay. If you look at it, it's one of those little things over here. And by the definition of its name, it has different phases, it has multi-layer, it has ceramic. Ceramic structures traditionally kind of difficulty, uh, are tricky for EBSD because EBSD uses very high dosage of electrons, whereas then charging problem becomes really obvious for non kind of semiconductors. Uh, with the new generation of detector, we can actually uh, get pretty good results for this material. So a standard, so here we are showing a typical SEM image of the cross-section. This cross-section is prepared by broadening ion molding. And we are seeing the layered nickel structure and in between the layers here 
are the porous ceramic structure. And here is the EDS result of that field of view. So just to point it out, we do have the EDS detector loaded on the same tool where, uh, that the EDS detector is on. So if possible, we can adjust the parameter so that uh, for the same sample setup, the same run, the sample load, we can do EDS analysis and EBSD analysis at the same location, the same setup. Um, for this one, we did a EBSD mapping of the square shift right here. And here you can see the color-coded orientation of each pixel and the black spots are the voice coloring to the voice we already see in the SEM image. So what we can do with the mapping here, you see a great example of two-phase material. The top row is a space map. We, we can isolate the nickel phase and then the ceramic phase. We can also analyze them together. Uh, each individual phase have their color-coded orientation map, and we can do green size calculation or green boundary analysis for individual phase or the two phase together. Here is a typical analysis result of green diameter distribution. This is so on the left are the standard result we'll give out in our reports. We have a distribution, a chart of the green diameter. We give out uh, the minimum, maximum, and average diameter of the uh, grain size. When necessary, if it's required, we can also provide the full statistics of each identified grain. That will introduce, uh, that will include the area, pyramid, uh, perimeter, the gravity of the particle, size, length, aspect ratio, and slope, with all the additional information, and we could do additional processing analysis of a statistical analysis. Uh, another standard analysis we provide is texture analysis for each sample. Uh, here is a, a very common to people who use XRD services. This is uh, the pole figure on, of the three major zones. Um, just to remember that EBSC data actually collects information of the crystal lattice on, in 3D space. So for each of the pole figures, it is a projection of the 2D space. And it's a reduced information. So if we want to know other side uh, texture of other directions and other points, we can also uh, extrapolate that. We can also get that from the raw ABSC data. All right, moving on to the second case study. Uh, here I'm going to show a few more interesting applications of the technique. Um, this is a copper flux connector. If anyone have ever uh, tried to disassemble your phone or <laughs> electronics, we may have encountered one of those. Uh, just look browsing through YouTube, I realized that people were able to make those with just uh, not very everyday, but like your copper tape. That's pretty handy. So I just grabbed one piece one day from the lab and look at the top surface of it. This is an example of when um, the sample doesn't need prep. It typically has to be like narrow finish and really smooth, but sometimes it will pass. Even if it's not, it's matte and very rough. So here is the SDM image. We will provide that as well. Um, in the SDM mode, we'll see the grooves along the copper tape. And on the right, I'm showing the forward scattered texture image. The forward scatter detector is one a couple of the diode located right at the top of uh, the edges of the EBS detector that's inserted. So this image we're using the bottom ones, which have a glazing angle relative to the tilted sample surface, which means this uh, image mode gives enhanced topographic contrast. As we can see here, all of the groups that we can vaguely see in the SEM image, they became much stronger in this FSD mode, and we can see some of the structures of the roughness locally too. And this will, uh, this is also is a good example showing why we were stressing that the sample have to be perfectly flat and smooth, as you are starting to see some true black 
and dark, these are actually shadows cast from the roughness of the surface. So what, it, what does it do to the result? Here is the final result. So we collected a VSD map from the center of the previous map. Uh, this is a 15 micron by 15 micron size. Here we are already seeing the shadowing here. Uh, there are no good spots in the shadows because there's no signal ex uh, escaping from that area. Um, here we are seeing lar very large grain structures. Some of the stripes might be twins, so we're guessing, but we don't know yet. Um, now here is a good point to, I think it's a good point to explain what we're looking at, this crazy color, uh, map, color map. Um, if you're familiar with the crystal structure, um, unit lattice, here is a you know, triangle of the orientation of the lattice. As we see, this what the color means, it has blue, red, and green here. Whenever you're seeing a true blue, that means at that pixel, and maybe here, you're looking at the crystal lattice with, in this case, a cubic structure. The corner of the cube is pointing out directly at the orientation that we assign which is normal to the plane in this case. Whenever we see a red grain or true red pixel, that means the face of the cubic lattice is looking at us. And then the, the same grain color means just edge of the cube is along the chosen direction. In this case, the perpendicular to the tape. Okay, so for this structure, something interesting is showing up but we can do a few more analysis of the grain. On the left side, the typical grain size analysis, we have average grain size and maximum uh, grain size distribution. Here is original map and then your unique grain color map, seeing the definition of each grain. On the right side, uh, we're doing the same thing with five degree misorientation definition of the grain. However, this time we're ignoring the grain to say whenever we cross the twin boundary, even though it's 60 degrees much larger than five degrees misorientation, because it's a special orientation on both either side of the boundary, we're gonna ignore it and say these belong to the same grain. So in this case, we're only showing the mother grain, which is so much bigger than the original analysis. So these are also very useful for um, the electronic properties. One more thing we can do with this kind of material or in other materials whenever it's needed, epitaxy, I think, will benefit from this too, is the, is the calculation of fraction of the specific orientation. If in any case you think your product, product uh, will behave better with a certain uh, crystal orientation aligned in any direction of, of your choice, so the normal to the wafer, along a special direction, we can map that out and do a calculation of the area fraction of that texture. Here we are showing 101 as a example. In this particular area, we're seeing 35% of 110 grains. So whether or not that's good or bad, we can have a parallel comparison of the reference sample as well. All right, so that is the last slide of my EDS examples. And then I'm gonna introduce a little more to the direct derivative technique of uh, ECCI, uh, which is electron channeling contrast imaging. This is a method that is also based on the same hardware. Um, because, so, and then we're going to go back to those FSD detectors I mentioned earlier, in this case, they are located right here, the dials on the bottom of the detector. Um, the, so how that is, how does it work? Basically, these are looking at like single crystals of high quality where we want to characterize the single dislocations and the, the density of the dislocation. Um, how does it work if uh, we think about the beam interaction with the crystal lattice when we have a perfect uh, crystal lattice, the incident beam direction when it comes into each atomic plane, they will have the same angle uh, relative to the beam. 
But whenever we are seeing a defect, like showing illustrated here, we'll definitely see a distortion of the relative angle around this defect, um, actually, which uh, means the strain build around it, right? And then the diffraction condition will change a certain channel and direction, then we will see the contrast from that distorted lattice area around our dislocation. Uh, why this is kind of related to EVSD is because to enhance this contrast, it's not showing, like the lattice disruption is always there, but we're not seeing that in SEM mode usually uh, because it needs to be highlighted or bring up as certain channeling orientation. And with the help of EVSD detector, we have the raw Kikuchi pattern to let us know which diffraction condition, like what crystal orientation we're looking at. So that enables us to go to that perfect channeling orientation to highlight those contrasts and find those defects. Uh, again, we're gonna go through a sample requirement for ECCI first. Uh, this time it does it has to be crystal line, but it also has to be almost single crystal sample, actually high quality single crystal sample. The sample uh, is technique is also based in uh, STM. Um, the area of interest or the detection limit is on also on the very top surface. If we care about the defect that's see on the top surface, this is great. If we want to know the block density, maybe not so much. Uh, surface, of course, have to be smooth. The same shadowing effects that we see in EDSD will also show up here. Thinking how tricky it is to get contrast in here and how easy the shadowing will over, over block all the other contrasts that we can understand this. Um, sample size is also nail size. And we do provide a guideline for um, defect density as a pretty high uh, quality crystal, uh, 10 to the eighth or uh, all the way to 10 to the fifth. It'll be good. All right, so we're gonna show two to three examples. Uh, first one is gallium nitrate sample. Uh, this is the SEM image of the sample. We do have a little bit of contamination, a few small particles and scanning uh, depositions, carbon depositions. This field of view is about 12 micron to eight micron size. And then we perform our um, diffraction rotation to make the sample rotate into the perfect condition at the exact same field of view. Once we are in ECCI mode, we will see these locations pop up with their contrast. Uh, so each one we can easily pick up where they're at. And we do have numerical methods to process the image and to automatically pick out each individual uh, defect, defect contrast. And these uh, are kind of measured by as particles and labeled. Here is the overlap of that analysis to the raw ECCI image. Uh, with that information, we can do a calculation or a countdown of the number of defects. And in this case, we have about 100 defects found in the field of view. And the estimated defect density is about 1 to the 10, 1, 10 to the 8 per centimeter square. So this is kind of going uh, at, the, at the higher, at the lower end of the defect density. But we can do even lower if the sample is flat and, and smooth enough as we can already see kind of the waviness of the surface sample and casting some uh, shades here, this range. If there is more roughness, it can interfere with the defect contrast itself. Uh, we did move on to a second location on the exact same sample. And this location is more kind of burnt out and looks uh, a lot of times we are seeing contamination more for many, after many skins. With a little bit of adjustment of the parameter, we can enhance the topographic uh, contrast on top of the lattice defect. So here in this location, in this condition, we're seeing the defect still, those little points popping up, but we're also starting to see atomic steps here. 
CRF. That provides more information, particularly from this case. Uh, we I give some references that this might look like a school dislocation because of uh, the twin lobe structure around it. That can be of interest to uh, people interested in of the type of dislocation coming up. Uh, however, if you want to know the exact type of this dislocation, the G.D. information of it, of course, this can also, this result can also give you a good marking and selection system. And you can go ahead and lift PM samples at the specific location. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in this specific uh, defect, we can move on to TM study to fully analyze the lot of defects over there. All right. The second uh, sample we look at is a aluminum nitride sample. Uh, same size of view, about 12 micron to 8 microns here. SCM and ECCI image. As you can see, the same locations back and forth. Uh, whenever we're at the def correct diffraction condition, we are seeing the defect area pop up as little bright spots. So this sample is almost reaching up to the top limits of um, defect density. If it's any higher, we can probably imagine what's going to happen is the defects will be even closer to each other and then it will be harder to differentiate neighboring dislocations to get a good um, statistics or labeling of individual defects. So again, we did image processing to pick up the each individual defects. And this particular sample, we actually did a blind study uh, with PlanView STM. Um, by ECCI of this exact image, it tells us the defect density is about 8.5 to 10 to the 8 per centimeter squared. Uh, on the parallel study, blind study we did with PlanView STEM, it is giving us the value of 1.14 to 10 to the 9 per centimeter squared. These values actually match up really well. On top of that, uh, the magnification, uh, so Magnitude, order of magnitude is the same, right? But on top of that, uh, the plan view TM study have actually slightly higher value uh, of defect density compared to ACCI, which is which is make, which really makes sense because if we think about it, ACCI method have uh, it's a superficial technique. It is counting all the defects that's lying on the top, like twenty nanometers of the sample. Well, for TM analysis, where, uh, the sample is, uh, the sample film is usually, let's say, maybe 100 nanometer-ish in thickness. And for transmission mode, it will definitely collect the contrast, which means it will, uh, through all the thickness, which means it will also calculate all the defects within that 100 nanometer thickness. So it will definitely be a little bit higher than what we see uh, in the superficial area by ECCI. So these results actually correlate really well and confirms each other. Uh, moving on. So another one we played with the silicon germanium sample. This one goes to maybe the upper limit of the field of view, which is uh, whatever field we can see in the SEM. This is about 300 microns by 200 micron size. The sample is very flat with some waviness on the 101 directions. And we're starting to see the cross head patterns, some line defects. Uh, these lines are very long and like rare to find. So we're not gonna get a statistical value of the density, but we can see the direction of them, interaction of the defects and spacing between those line defects as well. All right, so that's the part uh, derivative technique from of EBSC that's called ECCI. Let's go back to the main theme EBSC analysis. Here uh, we have a summarize of the EBSC technique strengths and limitations. Um, the strengths of the technique. It is a very visual imaging 
uh, technique, it has the ability to couple with statistical quantification as well. We get statistical uh, values of the grain size, fraction of certain orientations. Uh, we get fractions of different phases. Um, it gives also spatial information of the microstructure. Not only do we know how much area belongs to each individual phase or orientation, we can also give you a map of those information to see the relationship, how they grow or distribute with respect to each other. The technique have a very wide range of dimension that is inherent with the fact that it's built on SEM system. Uh, we have uh, microstructures that ranges from tens of nanometer all the way to centimeters. Um, the result contains the full 3D crystal orientation information. Um, we can generate projections of pole figures on any particular points that we're interested in. Here, uh, after that are limitations. The sample have to be perfectly cropped because this sort of, uh, the technique is a very superficial detection uh, information. So there, we have some limitations in certain samples. If they can be cropped really well or it can't be cleaved down to the size. Uh, another thing we need to be aware is we have to have some pre-existing knowledge of the crystal structure. Remember when we go back, when we start the analysis, um, there is a simulation of the Kikuchi band with relation to the perfect 3D structure of the sphere. We need to know what sphere we're using. We need to know what faces are inside the sample. Um, we can't just go get the raw data and hunt in the full sea of all the possible structures in the world. And this is a good point to link to the complementary techniques because we need the pre-existing knowledge of the sample. A lot of times uh, we actually collaborate with XRD techniques who will give us the face ID of the sample, what are present in the sample, different phases, their uh, fractions and symmetry structures. Uh, it can also act as a complementary technique whenever the sample grain size go out of range is too small for the technique. Sometimes it's not um, it's not too small, but I have a lot of definitions to interfere with the small. Then XRD is a great choice to characterize the smaller grain size structure. Um, other techniques that we collaborate a lot with at the same time have uh, include the SEM method. SEM have a similar sample prop uh, condition with EBSD. So we do share sample prop and we can share the same sample for a lot of instances we can get additional EDS mapping um, and SEM analysis on the same sample, same prop surface. This can be really handy. Um, TEM and the FIT side, we collaborate as, uh, with them a lot as well. Mostly benefits from um, the sample prop side uh, that can do uh, we can get just traditional TM lamellas. Then we can perform transmission EDSD, which further pushes down our detection limit to about 20 nanometers in grain size. Uh, sometimes when we get small structures, uh, like a particular site on, um, let's say, a chip or a pattern on a wafer, we want to be um, scanning on that specific uh, location, we can also do the lift uh, from the defined location. So that really, really helps us too. Um, okay. So with that said, I'm already mentioning a lot of other techniques that we regularly collaborate and uh, get uh, to help each other to get a full characterization of the project from different angles. Um, so here is a general guideline of how EAG service could help our clients because we have a lot of variety of services and test services with a broad range of instruments. So we have 
the ability to tackle on the most challenging materials and engineering related issues.